You're looking well. You know, I try sometimes. <laughs> you know, I try sometimes. <laughs> Mr. Brackens, how are you, sir? I'm well, and yourself? <laughs> I'm doing well. <laughs> I, was, I was looking forward to this because I tell you, you your book uh, is worth a read and a reread and another read. And, and uh, because every time, even I read them uh, a second time a couple of weeks ago when we were talking, right? and there are things I missed from the first time. And uh, uh, the profundity, uh, those who grew up in the church, uh, it's, it's no secret you know, necessarily who the parties are, right? Uh, but the, the, the implications uh, and the failures and the church uh, are, uh, are so profoundly inexcusable. Yeah. That, that uh, uh, but I think what, what makes this what drives the point home is I don't know even what to describe your your literary uh, I don't know how to describe your literary methodology I don't because it's not new criticism it's not literalism right it's not historicism uh -huh. it's, not, it's not these things that you learn in in, uh, in uh, 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 English theory but however you word it how whatever your methodology is, it's just, it's like you know exactly how to say it, to drive the point, to drive the point home and, and, and shed the most fun. It's not like the light is unflattering. It's that it's the right amount of light to show exactly what it is. Huh. And, and it's this right amount, it's because people say it's an unflattering light, the, the, that means the flat, the unflattering thing is the light. Oh, yeah, I but see what you're saying. it's not, right? It's the right amount of light to show the right thing. And, <laughs> and that's what's Um, first of all, I want to welcome everybody to the Worth Wiley Show. Uh, this is uh, a special edition in which uh, we are uh, discussing uh, questioning beliefs and uh, the impacts that uh, Christianity has had on uh, communities of color, as well as marginalized communities such as the LGBT community, LGBTQ community, and all the number of different al alphabets that go with that. Uh, but uh, uh, tonight on uh, the, sh the show, uh, we have uh, Chandrika D. Fee, uh, who is uh, the who was an author, a teacher, uh, an outdoor enthusiast. Uh, Chandrika has a bachelor's degree in biblical studies from Beacon University in Columbus, Georgia. She uh, has a heart to empower, mentor, and equip other teachers, parents, leaders, and entrepreneurs. Her career has allowed her to express her gifts and passions as far as the country of China, where she was voted and received uh, the 2008 to 2009 award for being one of the most popular foreign teachers of 150 foreign teachers at SIAS University by the School Foreign Language Student Society. Fendrika is now an outdoor enthusiast, a triathlete, a wellness coach by profession, and a partner with W Brand Publishing for the release of her debut book, Lord, I don't want to die a Christian. Welcome with me, my, my guest, Miss Chandrika B. B. Also with us tonight <laughs> is Jonathan Brackens. Uh, Jonathan is a black gay pastor from Midland, Texas, a 2L uh, at University of Massachusetts Law, and published academic author whose research examines the intersection between law, religion, and sexuality. His publications include Is Paul a Liar? The Pauline Corinthian Conflict and the Need to Reform in the, the Need for Reform in the American Church. The Tongue of the Learned, how the elaboration likelihood model and group communication 
and improve biblical literacy and Feed My Sheep, an analysis of the black-white biblical academic achievement gap. Currently, he is working on his forthcoming publication entitled The Weightier Matters of Justice, Mercy, and Faith by challenging the radical burden adopted in Matthew 13, 44, Parable Analysis. Earlier, I mentioned uh, Miss Alicia Pitts, who could not be with us tonight, and we're hoping that we can get her to connect uh, with the show later on. I, of course, am your host, Mr. Farron P. Wiley. I am a former pastor, church musician, and current author of Memoirs of Innocence Lost, with books including Tabernacle of Lies and Californication, in which I re recount my experiences growing up black and gay under the repressive influences of evangelical Christianity and surviving childhood sexual abuse at the hands of clergy and chronicling my deconversion from Christianity. I am, however, uh, your host for this special edition of The Worth Wiley Show. everybody uh, to uh, join in, listen in on the discussion. Uh, the purpose of, uh, of tonight's show is, uh, one, to cur cur curate dialogue around the growing number of black people who are questioning their religious beliefs, uh, to share our respective positions and journeys, as well as endeavor to demonstrate that it is possible to engage in dialogue from differing perspectives and hopefully be able to do so without disrespect to our respective humanity. Uh, and lastly, to heighten awareness about our published works and provide access to the available voices that can assist people in making choices for their own lives regarding these subject matters. And so uh, I am delighted to have uh, both of you here uh, to have these conversations. So I wanted to share a video with y'all just as a little funny icebreaker here. All right, just a little clip from The Simpsons because I like it. Come in. You, sir, have challenged me on scripture. Oh, well, if it's scripture you want to talk, then let us make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Good. Good. Punishment is the key to belief. Matthew 25, 46, they will go away to eternal punishment, but the... Righteous to eternal life? Sure, but God's grace is for everyone. John 12, 32, I will draw all people up to myself. Ah, what about 2 Thessalonians 1, 9? They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Romans 11, 32. He may have mercy on them all. Them all. Genesis 3, 23. So the Lord banished him from the garden. Genesis 1, 31. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Bang. Ah. I'm cold. So cold, and I'm wearing three sweaters. Well, just a little funny piece there that I thought <laughs> kind of uh, itemizes how, kind of uh, illustrates how, how uh, some people go about uh, having their conversations, and this this idea that that we we have to win. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and sometimes we get caught up in the idea that we, we're so caught up in being right. And this is what I used to preach. I said, we're so caught up in being right that we forget about being righteous. And uh, but as a uh, icebreaker question tonight, I, I wanted to 
to to emphasize that you know we're not really here to debate if if however debate will pro may, may arise um but as a means of starting the conversation i'd like to pose a question to all of us uh however in answering you can use the time to uh talk about your books your published works in connection with your answers uh the question goes out to all of us but i'd like to start with shandrika and uh, what is it that you think Christianity gets right and or gets wrong as it relates to the overall health of marginalized communities such as black people and the LGBT community? And how does your book address those concerns? Um, first, uh, what, what we get, what the I should say what Christianity gets right um, but I think perhaps it's the wrong motive is we get right uh, serving the community the 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 religion called Christianity does well to you know feed the hungry and um, clothe the widow um, You know, serve perhaps the orphans, uh, in the sense of, of of creating these events to do so. But I think it's with the wrong motive. Mm. Um, it is to to fill up, in most cases, to add to the to the congregation. Um, it is to uh, to build membership. Um, rather than expressing and being an expression of the love of God. Um, in that in that case, that is one thing, um, as it relates to the marginalized community, that is one thing that is happening both correctly, correct and wrong, right and wrong, in the mm. same, in the same sense, doing the right thing, but with the wrong motive. Okay. Um, I am not, uh, I'm not a part of, I am, I'm only black. I'm a black woman. Um, I'm a black heterosexual woman. So I didn't write um, anything about um, the LGBT community or even being black. Um, but I do talk about um, how I believe Christianity is supposed to uh, treat people. And I ask the question, um, in my book called What If, and the extension of that question, in the it, the book is Lord, I Don't Want to Die Christian, but the chapter is What If, and it's the extension of that question is What If Jesus Worked the drive through And, you know, likening how I believe um, we are to be treating each other, um, of course, asking Christianity the question, um, about how to treat people um, that are different from them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, if if we were working the drive-through, all we would always hear is, is the need, if you will, even of the marginalized. Right. And be ready quickly to answer or provide a solution to the need because we can't see who needs it. Okay. So I do talk about, I, talk, I challenge Christianity in that sense, but then um, I write a piece in, in the book called The Sequel. And it's the sequel to that where I actually challenge Jesus to, to the experience of working the drive-through because he was approached with a need. Um, and he uh, said to the Seraphonician woman, mm. um, I didn't come for you. Mm. Uh, what I have to offer um, is not for you and to give it to you would be to give it to the dogs and it's literally is based he, he hesitates to uh, to be the door of solution to her based on her ethnicity her difference solely that mm -hmm. and so I wonder you know, I called Jesus to the drive-thru in the sequel, and I asked the question, 
what is it to be done when it is Jesus who needs the experience of working the drive through Awesome, awesome, awesome. You, uh, Jonathan, do you want to jump in here and maybe kind of answer the question uh, in your words? Uh, certainly, certainly. Uh, thank you for having me in, and, uh, here. Uh, so uh, what I think the church gets right, let me, see, let me start with, let me say what the church gets wrong. All right, because, uh, I, well, well I'll, I'll say I'll start with what the church gets right. What I think the church gets right is that they were able to test, to to tell us there is a man whose name is Jesus, <laughs> and that there was an emperor whose name was Pontius Pilate, and that Jesus was executed by this man, and. Three days later, people claim to see Jesus alive. I think the church gets that part right. Much about everything else, uh, <laughs> I, I think that's where we, we navigate, right? <laughs> okay. Because, because we don't need the scripture to let us know there was a man named Jesus, the Caiaphas, Josephus, other his, Roman historians at that time can show us that. Right? We don't need the Bible to tell us that there was a man named Pontius Pilate, the angel of, of Roman history, let's say. Mm. Right? And, and we know there was an order of execution, and most people don't survive those orders, so we can assume that it, it was death, and, uh, and that we uh, believe whether we don't have scientific proof that Jesus was seen three days later, but we have enough testimony to say that people believe we saw Jesus. And I believe we got that right. And like I said, when we start coming away from that core, that's where I think we start to fall apart uh, uh, in, in, in some embarrassing ways. Now, my uh, publication from, from uh, the review of religious research called Feed My Sheep, the analysis of the black, white, biblical, academic achievement gap is what I'm going to use right now to say, suggest one of the things the church got wrong. And uh, uh, I'm going to say that, then I want to talk about the, the, the Canaanite woman that was called the dog. Me too, I want to talk about it. She didn't pull any punch. She gave it to me. I have to be about that. I analyzed the Pew Research Center's data uh, survey uh, of uh, religion and public life. And what we found was uh, there's an assumption in academia that the more classes you attend, the better you do, the, the better your academic performance in that class. The less classes you attend, the, the, the worse you do, you get worse your performance is in the class. That is the growing trend. That is the, the ubiquitous trend. Uh, uh, that is seen uh, 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 regardless of subject matter, except when the subject matter has to deal with biblical knowledge. Mm. So what we were able to identify from that a few research centers data set is that the, the inverse, that the more church African Americans attended, the more services they attended, the less likely they were to be able to, to answer basic biblical questions, like where was Jesus born, like the name of the gospel. Mm -hmm. They were unable to answer that. And again, that's counterintuitive to what you think, because for everything else, the more, the more classes you attend, the better you perform in recalling the information and, and performance in that class. This trend isn't seen among white people. Hmm. White Christians, the trend is seen just like it would be in academia. The more church uh, 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 white people attend, right, the better they are at answering basic biblical questions. But African Americans, again, as and 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 uh, 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 this is what caused the review of research to uh, publish that, and then uh, later. Uh, 
uh, there's a, a book on the handbook of the sociology of religion that uh, that uh, those authors cited me in their book. I was uh, privileged to, 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 to uh, provide them that information for that. Uh, but African Americans, again, can't answer. There's something about the nature of African American, the churches that, that minister to African Americans. There's something about that that they don't get. Their, their focus isn't about biblical exegesis. It's not about under, even understanding the text. It is very, the effect is, is, is absolutely counterintuitive. When an African American who attends Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, Friday night service, uh, Saturday Bible study, and, but unfortunately, when asked questions, they're basic. Like, what is the first book of the Bible? King James. Uh, where, according to the Bible, was Jesus born? Which of these religions, religious groups traditionally teaches that salvation comes through faith alone? I mean, come on, right? You would be, you, please tell me which of the following is not a Ten Commandments. Uh, 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 which Bible figure is most closely associated with the willingness to sacrifice his son uh, for God, right? They can't answer these questions. So it brings up the question, what are you teaching in the church? What, because, because if it's supposed to come out of, if it's supposed to come out of this book, right, they should be able to answer these questions, especially if they're attending these, the more than uh, four services a week. Mm -hmm. And so something is broken in our exegesis. Something is broken in our preaching. Something's broken in our ministry. To where we're not able to to even answer that it we have a detrimental correlation, a negative correlation mm -hmm. in attendance to understanding what's in this book. And the fact of the matter is, understanding what's in this book to me is only step one, because there are things that are considerably wrong in this book. They're, they are profoundly incorrect. So if we can't get them to even broach these basic things, we'll never get them to understand the complexity to which they can understand that the Bible actually does not condemn homosexuality. Mm. They would never be able to address that because yeah. they don't. They can't even tell me what Jesus is born. Uh, uh, and to the uh, Syrophoenician, uh, to the woman uh, in Cana, uh, I, I do want to state that it is a very it is a in an unfortunate situation where he says, I, I, you know, I'm sent to the lost sheep of Israel, right? And and he says it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. And I have wrestled with uh, that in Matthew, uh, uh, I believe it's Matthew 15. Uh, I've wrestled with that until I understood through uh, redaction criticism that Matthew, as a gospel writer, had a had a specific intent. We can see that his intent was pernetic, that he wanted his brand of Christianity, which was a was which was which was a Jewish shoot, a Jewish branch of Christianity. He wanted his sect of Christianity uh, to be preserved against the contamination of the world. To Matthew, uh, Gentiles was were or maybe an ancillary, a tangential effect of Christianity, but they weren't the chosen ones of God. They weren't the people who Jesus was supposed to come to. And so all throughout Matthew, we see an exclusion of the Gentile. That's not seen in Luke. It's not seen in John, right? Because Matthew, as a writer, had a specific reason. We see how he, through uh, Matthew chapter 13, when he cre when he creates his version of the parable, how he is very much concerned about separating good from evil, wheat from tear, mm -hmm. good fish from bad fish, right? Uh, the, the, treasure of, uh, the, the treasure hidden in the field versus the merchant who, who saw the pearl and purchased it. So Matthew's, Matthew's authorial intent really shaped, is, is really, uh, is undeniable, and it shaped his entire product. So so perhaps, I say perhaps, perhaps it's not Jesus 
an accurate as an accurate portrayal of Jesus as we would desire, but it is certainly how Matthew wanted us to see. And thankfully, we have other people's accounts of Jesus that helps refute uh, uh, the, the the racist, the, the separatist, uh, uh, and uh, uh, protectionist and exclusionist exclusionist views of uh, Matthew. But uh, I tell you, it, it, it's a hard thing to overcome, and you, but you have to not have to once you understand Matthew's authorial intent. Uh, we start to understand why he would state that Jesus said something that harsh and discriminatory uh, to a woman, yet gave her, in the end, gave her the miracle. I'll shut up now. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, where, where I think Christianity gets it wrong <clears throat> is <clears throat> the proclamation that the Bible is the unadulterated, authoritative, uh, inerrant word of God. Uh, it is presented to us that this is how God speaks to us. And even if you are hearing what you think is the voice of God, if it does not line up, with this word, you are not hearing God. Uh, and so that's out of my little Pentecostal background. Other people might have learned differently, but that's how I was raised. And, I, you know, they, 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 they say you're born in. You ain't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, holiness is right. And so that's what I, that's what I was taught. And so. Uh, it was it, it was the Bible. Uh, it was a very literal interpretation. Uh, uh, I would have, as as a as a regular church goer, I would have never uh, been able to make the distinction that the Gospels were actually different points of view. Uh, and I and I and 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 hearing what you uh, even had to say about the the book of Matthew, I can't imagine if Matthew was alive that he would have been happy that his writings would have been bound to everybody else's and considered uh, as gospel. Amen. Uh, that you know, considering how much damage it would have done to his credibility. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, what I think Christianity perhaps gets right is the, is the idea of, you know, loving one another, uh, trying, to, trying to treat each other right. Uh, you know, um, I, 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 still, I still struggle with how you expect to arrive there with everything else that's in there. Um, you know, with all of the divisiveness and all of the, you know, the Bible to me consistently creates an us and a them. And um, the, even the command, I mean, if you got two commands that was, you know, Jesus said out of the 10 or out of all the law, these two, you know, love God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and everything, in, in other words, love God with everything that you are. And the second is love your neighbor as, or in direct proportion to, how you love yourself. So the passage in itself assumes that the reader actually loves themselves, first of all. But the the Bible doesn't really allude to any instructional pathways to teach someone how to love themselves. Uh, in fact, it kind of poo-poo's the idea. It, talking about putting yourself last and you know taking care of somebody else's needs first, and uh, uh, and the idea that you can't 
love anybody else until you learn to love God first. But uh, delve, delving fur further into it, you have all of these characteristics of God where he says, uh, you know, uh, uh, who, who is it? Be ye, uh, Paul, I guess it was Paul who said, be ye imitators of God. Well, God says he's the only one that gets to be jealous. And he's the only one who gets to uh, exact vengeance. And so uh, <clears throat> there are all of these dichotomies that leave the reader in or the or the, the hearer in the place of brain fry. And so where where you where you end up at to 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 to, to Jonathan's point is you end up with people who cannot decipher what the what the Bible is, or the is actually saying and what message that they should be following. So they completely rely on what somebody else is telling them. And unfortunately, the message that they're getting is do what the pastor say. And you'll be all right. And that typically leads people <laughs> into this. It, it, unfortunately, it, it mimics and emulates the whole um, slave master relationship that in my opinion uh what what the bible was used for black people in the first place right uh it was to bring you into subjection do what i say and one day you're gonna get to heaven because you were obedient so that's my position in a nutshell um, that, you know, that if I was going to continue doing church, uh, they, every brick, they're going to have to tear every brick up out that piece and rebuild it. Cause I, 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 I just could, I couldn't do it. I can't do it no more. So, I mean, I, I, I believe in loving people. I, I try to get along. Um, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit up here and, you know, um, I still don't know how they how they how they make bricks out of straw. I mean, I don't know how to do that. So I'm not going to try to do that naturally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, whatever. You know, I'm gonna go find me some cement. I'm gonna mix it up in a pot and let it dry out, and then I'm gonna stand on it. And I'm not gonna pretend like I know how to do that. That, that's what that's that's where I'm at with that. But in regards to the <laughs> the Sarah Phoenicia woman, I um um I have preached that, and I have preached around it, and I have preached over the top of it, and you know, and you know, why did Jesus call this woman a bee? And I could, I could not. I mean, if you were gonna put it in, <laughs> if, if you were gonna, if you were gonna put it in today's vernacular, it is the truth. And yo, know, scholars try to pull around it, and you know, it, it was a little itty bitty lap dog, and you know, it was uh, you know the cute pet or whatever. But a dog is a dog is a dog. Amen. And. Uh, so, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I preached in any number of ways that I could so that we would, so that people would not lose their perfect image of Jesus. And I even preached it in a way that, you know, that said, you know, that Jesus had to realize and it was going to take this woman's faith to realize that if he was going to die for everybody, then he was going to have to learn to love everybody, even if she was not a Jew first. And so it worked. 
and the church went up and it was it was it was wonderful but i still cannot get past how an omniscient omnibenevolent omnipresent god who is embodied who says if and in jesus who says if you've seen me you've seen the father is going to be okay with being a racist and so that's that's just one of my things. So I'm glad you brought that up. I just, <laughs> I just <laughs> that's just one of my things. So um, uh, the the idea that if if and John Jonathan, you and I have talked about this, uh, but if the God of the Bible is not that God then God has a responsibility to reveal himself to us in ways that we can understand. And not in mysteries and, you know, cloak and dagger and being the, the hide and seek champion of the world. So, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to hurt nobody's feelings. And I, and, I, and I said, I just said, I just said, you know, I said, if it gets too heavy, I'm going to put on Tina Turner and say, I don't want to fight no more. You know, I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, like your book, right? He has a way of wording that makes it very, makes it very hard uh, to refute, not because it, it's impossible to do so. But in order to refute it, you cannot say it with the finesse that he used to make the point, right? <laughs> and so he he has delivery on his side, uh, uh, you know, when 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 he is speaking. But uh, uh, you know, when you when you say that, uh, you know, they've been making brick straw brick for they just mix it with mud. Mm -hmm. Why? Right? You you can you can make those. Right? Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, and and I I understand uh, the point that, that that perhaps God should have uh, uh, done it differently. Uh, but it presupposes that God did the Bible to begin. With. Come on, sir. And 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 so we can't. And we have been presented with an account of people's interaction with God. Mm -hmm. We have no evidence that God did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the evidence that man did, and let's right. be clear, Second Timothy two three sixteen, in which you alluded to before, that all scriptures are God breathed uh, and inspired and good for instruction and such, is is number one is illogical to apply that scripture to to what we now call the, the Bible, because yeah. it it was a letter to Timothy. Mm -hmm. And when it said scripture in that letter to Timothy at the time of its writing, it cannot contemplate what would exist after the writing. Mm -hmm. It only contemplated as the writer what existed before the letter. That would have to be the Hebrew Bible, not what we call the New Testament or the Christian or the, or right. the, or the Christian Bible. Or not even the his Bible. own writings. Not yeah. even his own writings. The right. second issue we have with Second Timothy is that it is pseudepigraphic, which mm. means after we analyze all of the letters that have been attributed to Paul, its word choice, its statement, the history of knowing when he was arrested and where he was, it has been found and unequivocally so that Paul never wrote Second Timothy. Mm. It was someone posing as Paul to write it while Paul was incarcerated. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means that somebody presented text under false pretenses mm -hmm. to advance an ideology that never came from the person they said it came from. So, Eve, so, so it is unfortunate for Christianity to hang its hat on the infallibility of the word by, number one, presupposing that the scripture, it, that the scripture that it referred to is the scripture that the reader understands mm -hmm. as the case. And number two, that the writing is pseudographic. It has to be thrown out. It's just false. It's not the writer. So even so when you extract Second Timothy, 
you realize there is no other book, no other scripture, no other passage that suggests this compilation is divine. Mm -hmm. And that is okay. Because if we think that John, and I'll shut up, uh, uh, has a point, John said, recalled that Jesus said, Lord, I don't pray, Father, I don't pray for these alone, but for those who believe in me through their message, that they be one as you and I are one. Then it presupposes that Jesus' intent for the message to go forth was not through the canonization of a text, but through the passing on of a message and then an experience with God. Because that's what they sought. So this these different accounts show as a way that somebody wanted to memorialize what they understood. Not that it was in any way, shape, form, or fashion divine. It's not. Mm. It is it is tantamount to saying your your is tantamount to saying each one of your books is scripture. It's your account. There's truth that resides in something, right? There's some truth that resides resides there. But it is not divine. It's human account of something. So, uh, Shandrik, uh, um in context of the conversation that we're having and the title of your book, what what led you to uh, uh, to go to go with that title? Lord, I don't 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 let me die, Christian. I am Christian. Um, it's Lord, I don't want to die a oh, Christian. Oh, Lord, I don't want to die a Christian. My bad. Yes. And uh, it, a lot of, actually, a lot of, of, of um, what was just said, I read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It took me two and a half months to do it. I spent every day eating, reading, uh, bathing, sleeping. I did that for two and a half months. and. I want to, I think I want to add, you know, also too, that there's a, um, uh, that what, it, what also is presupposed is that people were actually having an experience with God. Hmm. Oh, la, ha, ha. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and then, and then documenting that experience, whether it be, you know, someone documenting someone else's experience. Um, but it's still left to us to interpret an experience. And, and that's what I was seeing as I was reading is that uh, based on my experience of God or based on experiences I've had and assigned those, assigning them to God, I was, was reading I was reading things that did not um, reflect what I have interpreted to be an experience of God. Mm -hmm. So just like I can, you know, and I, I tell people this all the time, you know, we say that the, the, the Bible is inherent and, and it all came from God. And, uh, you know, but when when an army is told to go and kill mothers and children, yeah, you know, we assign that to God. Mm -hmm. But when David Koresh said, <laughs> you right. know, that what he was doing was God, we was all heartbroken and he was crazy. <laughs> but this, you know, but the same can be, Oh, it, the same can be okay because it's in a book called the Bible and God said, do it. And so I think the other thing is, is, is to believe that a lot of what we're reading is really God. Mm. A lot of what's lacking is having our own experience. So we don't have, we don't have anything to compare to what we're reading to say, I got a question about that. I, I, that ain't sitting well with me. Mm -hmm. Uh, all we have is just what we're reading, and and there is again the word, the 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 presupposing of the the thought that people are really experiencing God. You know, 
as we're reading the text. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, so I, I didn't want to, if, if I have to presuppose to be a Christian, then I don't want to be, to answer your question. Mm -hmm. If if as a part, if 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 as a part of 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 uh, my experience of God, I have to presume um, that the Bible is inherent. Um, I have to presume that uh, that a lot of the Old Testament, the ugly, the dirty, the bloody, mm -hmm. um, is all God. Then I don't want it. And that is. I and that is a s similar question that has arisen for me. Uh, um, you, know, I, you know, of course, I I have challenges with the uh, instructive uh, uh, nature in I don't know if it's Exodus, where God clearly gives instructions on how to beat your slaves, and with within the you know as long as you don't kill them. You know, you'll be all, you, you, you all right. So, again, I'm always hitting with the omniscience, omnipotence. And and so if you know that that is going to be misinterpreted, <laughs> even if it's even if it's not what you what you said, if you know that that's going to impact uh, laws and legislation and how that would be interpreted even down the road to to uh, chattel slavery, that white people would use that as a uh, justification for all the atrocities that were uh, committed. Um, it is hard for me to see the... Um, the, the practicality one of letting that narrative continue. Uh, if you are the God of the universe, then you bear a responsibility to communicate your most important message in ways that can be uh, clearly uh, understood. And so I, I, I'm, I'm always, you know, People ask me sometimes, you know, you know, all this stuff going on with the church is just a, a, a shame, and you know, the people leave, leaving God. And I said they left. I said they 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 are they are acting out what they understand that book to say, and I'm not surprised anymore that you know that that we have the both and you know we we have. Preachers in the pulpit, you know, declaring holiness and righteousness and, you know, fasting and praying and being on your feet. And they're on the whole stroll on on Friday night every, every, at, 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 at other times when they're, when they're not. So, and we have these scandals and people are, are, end up not being who they say they are. I attribute that to the Bible making a declaration that is actually in opposition to everything that is human about us and demanding a supernatural existence. In other words, deny your flesh, deny your sexual desires, deny the fact that you're hungry, uh, deny the fact that you're poor, and you live on this this plane, the spiritual plane that you, you know, in this supernatural existence that you can't see, but but you're there, and so we're we're constantly striving to live in this supernatural realm, denying everything that is human about us. Eventually, instinct is gonna kick in, and the real you is gonna show up. And I don't care how much, you know, uh, how, how much praying you do or how much, you know, deliverance and throwing up in the bucket or whatever you want to do, you still going to be you. 
and I should not be uh, I should not have to be made to feel guilty about being who I am in the world. And uh, that's what I see come, you know, coming from much, much of Christianity. Like, the, the, you know, you, you're backsliding or you, you, you don't got off in, in the sin. You don't got away from, away from God. And we end up with a whole bunch of people who do not know who they are. And eventually they start exploring that. And it's, you slap a label of, of, of sin on it. And, um. Uh, um, I have just made a decision that I don't want to live that way anymore. I don't want to have to live under the auspices that everything about me is against my creator. If, you know, and if that and if that creator and if that God exists and I'm allowed to have a personal relationship, then he's going to be all right with whatever it is. So I wanted to say what I hear you saying is, you know, here here we are um, at one point presupposing that uh, God gave, if you will, the Bible, and then I say, um, uh, then there is the pre the, the presupposing of of um, the experience or people experiencing perhaps life calling it God, and then you say, <laughs> this is what I hear you. Say. There's a there's a presupposing that there is a God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it, and this is the thing. There's a pre the, the presupposition is, and and I think it comes from the the teaching of scripture in a particular way, and that is that I see the plan of salvation as a solution to a problem of its own making. So I'm growing up um, a happy-go-lucky kid who's pretty much okay with life. I have no idea that there's anything wrong with me until I meet Jesus or I'm introduced to this character, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I am told that um, well, you know, eventually I'm told that my particular brand of sin is the, the most offensive mm -hmm. and a stench in the nostrils of God. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I am powerless to do anything about it except I engage this relationship with this character, this person that I've never seen. I'm 11 years old. And so I'm not sure how I'm supposed to process all this, but all of, you know, it's every, it's sanctioned by my teachers, the church leaders, my family, the whole bit, everybody's doing it. So I'm trying to do this the best way that I know how. So the only way I'm learning this behavior is by watching those around me. By no means at 11 years old am I going to engage a study on the Torah. Right, what you might not know is he, he, he's laying the foundation to undercut a response I'm about to say. Now go finish the statement. All I'm saying <laughs> All I'm saying is the average Christian is not going to be doing all this study. If it's going, if you're going to have this relationship, it ought to be plain. Uh, if you, even if you're going to leave breadcrumbs for, for you know for for me to follow, it at at 11 years old, it better be a loaf. <laughs> I'm not. I'm, all, all I'm saying is, it's like you. The 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 burden of making the Christian relationship or the relationship with God a reality is always on the seeker. 
and never upon the one who says they're the one that desires this relationship with you. And so many, many years of engaging that relationship, praying, fasting, asking to, you know, to, you know, uh, or prayer requests unanswered, you know, eventually I'm like, what exactly are you doing? And now, are you even there? Mm -hmm. And still silence. So I guess this is what the relationship is. We just, we just, we just sit here and, and, and look at each other, look look for each other. <laughs> Ooh, I love it. I love it. So go ahead, Jonathan. I know you was waiting to jump in. <laughs> no, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. They don't. Anyway, let me let me get the point. You know, I I have this belief that God continually makes Himself known to people, and we are taught to ignore Him. Hmm. So 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 so. Uh, I remember, I remember being uh, walking in the subway. I was, I was living in Brooklyn, and and I remember walking into the subway, and all of a sudden I felt the presence of God. And I remember when I uh, uh, got had, through handling my business and coming home, I said, God, I mean, because anybody living in Brooklyn or living by the subway, you, you, it's, they're not worshiping God. It's, it's not like there's a service there. But I know the presence of God, and so when I was walking. Uh, uh, and I got on 45th Street, headed down to the uh, down uh, into the subway. All of a sudden, I felt the presence of God, and it baffled me. I was on the when uh, the the end train came up uh, on the Manhattan Bridge. Uh, uh, I felt the presence of God, and I'm saying, "What? Well, how are you on the subway?" And nothing about how I was raised to identify or to be in the presence of God matched where He was feeding me. I was in Zara. In, Man in, 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 in uh, Manhattan, and there he was. I was minding my own business. There he is, trying to figure out, why are you here? I was shopping, and they were playing Christian music. And I felt the presence of God. And so he began to, because I had a relationship with God, I tell people, I tell, they, people ask me, how did your, how did your Christianity, your relationship with God, uh, survive your, your uh, uh, acceptance of your homosexuality? And I said it because of this, um, how he treated me as a child and a young man, and as I took over the pastor, uh, pastorate and such, uh, we developed a relationship that when uh, one night I, I had, uh, and it was a fantastic relationship, but when I moved to New York City, I was in bed one night and, and I woke up and a flop sweat because I had a nightmare. I had a nightmare that my parents were trying to make me marry this woman who had a crush on me in church. They were forcing me to marry her, and it was so bad. It was a nightmare. I woke up and I was. I feel sweating. it now. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and when I got up, uh, uh, the Lord said to me, He said, You care more about what other people think of you. Than what I think, and 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 of course, just like Peter would say, Lord, no, like no, you're you're wrong, you're incorrect, and he said, no, you do because you know I'm okay with you being gay, but yet you hide it from the church, you hide it from your minister, you hide it from the people you associate with because of what they what they think and what they and then you know you're you're gonna not be associated. with but if you know that I'm okay with you, then you should walk accepting that. And if my opinion is important, then you should be able to accept that I accept you in the face of rejection of others. And I, I, it was so profound to hear him say that, that I got on Facebook and, of course, I, I, I outed my own self, right? And, and people told me I was going to go to hell and all this stuff and I needed to re re repent because the the Lord's calling is upon me, and 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 I I you know what the Scripture says, and and, uh, and and they wanted to restore such a one that was that was overcome and, and restore. And uh, uh, and I remember all of the 
negativity from from pastors and such so much that I remember sitting in my uh, uh, room by my piano and I said, Lord, if I have to die, go to hell because of I, because I can't help who I love. That's okay. Because what I have with you on earth now 